Thanksgiving is a happy time of the year for most people. Family, memories, and good food to name a few positive things. For 56-year-old Bill Nelson, Thanksgiving Day in 1991 was a complete nightmare and something straight out of a grotesque horror movie. The things that happened to him were completely unbelievable, and granted I only have 7 videos on the channel, this is the worst case by far that I've covered. This case is very disturbing and gross, you've been warned. Hey there, I'm Jeremy the Crime Historian. I do up to two videos a week, so if that's something you want to keep up with, consider subscribing below. I also have a playlist on my channel that has all the episodes in one neat little place. But anyways, enough babbling, let's get into the story. Our story starts all the way over in Egypt, all the way back in 1968. It's here that a young girl, Omaima Ari Nelson, was born. While growing up in a poor village in southern Egypt, it's alleged that her and her mother suffered abuse at the hands of her father. According to Omaima, her father was said to be abusive both physically and sexually towards her and her mother. When she was young, she was subjected to a female circumcision against her will. This made any sexual encounters painful and traumatic from that point forward. Being scared and fed up with the abuse, Omaima's mother left her abusive husband and took Omaima with her. While this is great news being separated from their abuser, they had another problem. Now they had even less money than before and were living in complete poverty. They had to move to a slum in Cairo known as the City of the Dead due to the rickety rundown shacks being built amongst burial tombs. They lived in this area struggling to get by for years. Shortly after Omaima turned 18, she met an unnamed American oil worker and they started a relationship together. As the pair's relationship progressed rather quickly, Omaima's mother insisted that they get married. She saw this as an opportunity for Omaima to escape poverty. The couple then married, and once her husband's job finished in Egypt, they traveled all the way to his home state, Texas. Upon arriving in Texas, the relationship didn't last more than a few months and the two separated. Now, Omaima was in an unfamiliar country and she barely even spoke English. To top things off, she also had no money. Therefore, she had to take odd nanny and housekeeping jobs just to get a little money coming in. This wasn't enough and she turned to petty theft. Occasionally, due to her good looks, she was also able to pick up a few small modeling jobs, but these were few and far between. The main way she survived during these early years in the United States was a revolving door of boyfriends. She would quickly befriend a man and then escalate the relationship to the highest level and quickly move in with them. Once she moved in, she would start spending their money freely and recklessly without a care. These relationships never lasted long and would always end in one of two ways. Either the man would get irritated and angrily confront Omaima about her spending habits leading to a breakup between the pair, or Omaima would simply get bored. No matter how the relationship ended though, Omaima would rob them before disappearing from their life. There was one relationship during this stretch that ended much differently than the others. In 1990, Omaima got with a man named Robert Hansen. The relationship ended much like the others in an argument, however, when it was convenient for her, Omaima tied Robert to a chair and then proceeded to threaten him with a shotgun to his face. While he was still tied up, Omaima robbed him of all of his valuables before disappearing from his life. After some time of going from place to place, in the fall of 1991, she ended up in Orange County, California. While there, she entered a bar and saw a few men playing pool. As she observed them, one man caught her eye. He was a 6'3", 230-pound boisterous guy. He was waving a huge wad of cash and was bragging about the large amount of land he owned back in Texas. This man was 56-year-old Bill Nelson, a former pilot. Omaima approached Bill and the pair quickly hit it off. Despite Bill already being legally married to another woman, the two had a quick wedding before departing on a honeymoon through Texas and Arkansas to meet Bill's family. Bill's family was very skeptical and suspicious of the 23-year-old Omaima, believing her to only be with Bill for his money due to the large age gap between the pair. Regardless of these inner thoughts, the trip ended without much incident. Bill and Omaima then returned to California to Bill's apartment in Costa Mesa. It's here that Omaima alleges Bill turned violent against her, physically assaulting her and forcing her into sexual encounters involving BDSM over the next four weeks. That brings us to November 28, 1991, Thanksgiving Day. Bill called his daughter Margaret and invited her over to join him and Omaima for a Thanksgiving dinner. Margaret refused. Little did she know this would be the last time she would ever speak with her father. Just a few days later, in the early morning hours of December 1st, Omaima's ex-boyfriend Jose received a knock at his door. Upon opening it, he saw Omaima. With small cuts on her hands, arms, and face, she was crying. Upon leaning out of the door and looking around Omaima, he saw a red Corvette with heavy black trash bags in the passenger seat. 
He turned his attention back to Omaima, who then explained that her husband had forced himself on her and she had to kill him in self-defense. She then went on to say that she needed help disposing of the body. She offered to pay Jose $75,000 in cash along with two motorcycles for his trouble. Jose then said, okay, I'll meet you at your apartment. I need to get a truck first to help us dispose of the body. Omaima accepted this answer, but when she left, Jose turned around and called the police. After the call, police located Omaima in Bill's Corvette and stopped her. Upon looking inside the vehicle, the officer saw trash bags in the passenger seat. Investigating the bags further, he found what looked to be human lungs inside. Police brought her in for questioning, and Omaima claimed the organs were from someone that Bill Nelson had killed. She went on to claim that Bill was on a business trip in Florida. Not buying her story one bit, the police obtained a warrant to search the couple's Costa Mesa apartment, and what they found inside was absolutely horrifying. Once inside the apartment, officers noted there were numerous boxes of computer parts piled up. Not out of the ordinary, as Bill did computer repair work on the side. However, the officers started moving the boxes and performing their search. Almost immediately, they noticed suitcases crammed inside of some of the larger boxes mixed in with computer parts. Inside of these suitcases were black trash bags, and inside of the trash bags were human remains. Mixed amongst this horrific discovery was a clothing iron that had been warped and bent with human hair and blood on it, as well as a broken lamp with blood stains on the base of it. And while they couldn't believe what they were finding, it got much worse. The officers fanned out and proceeded with the search. One officer recalls stepping into the bathroom and seeing a human torso hanging above the bathtub only it had been skinned and was dripping into the tub. Meanwhile, in the bedroom there was an extremely bloody mattress, thin ropes littering the ground, and broken bedposts where someone had been restrained and attempted to break free. The kitchen was by far the worst area. Upon looking into a deep fryer that was on the counter, they saw two human hands floating in the oil. They looked in the trash and saw human meat mixed with turkey meat and cranberry sauce. Lastly, the freezer held another grizzling discovery. Once the frozen vegetables had been moved aside, there was a large object wrapped in foil stuck inside a blue container. Inside of the foil was Bill's head. It had been cooked. This information found at the crime scene was relayed back to the police station where they pressed Omaima for further details. She flip-flopped her story and was acting quite strangely. At first, she insisted Bill was still alive, but then minutes later, she claimed a demon had made her kill her husband. Another story of hers was that Bill had tried forcing himself onto her and she had killed him in self-defense. She was then sent to a nearby hospital and examined where they found no trauma and no signs of abuse. They added that the marks on her face and hands were not defensive wounds, but were more in line with injuries sustained while cutting up a body. The medical examiner tried to piece together what was left of Bill Nelson and found that besides the obvious decapitation, he had been castrated too. The cause of death was blunt force trauma injuries to the skull. The injuries were consistent with the shape of the clothing iron and the lamp base. The examiner also concluded something else. There was over a hundred pounds of Bill Nelson missing. Lining up with this disturbing revelation were reports from neighbors that said the garbage disposal in the Nelson apartment had been running for about two days beginning on Thanksgiving evening. From what authorities were able to piece together through evidence, on that Thanksgiving night, Omaima lured Bill to the bedroom with the promise of adult activities. He was then tied to the four bedposts, and something ensued afterwards which led to Omaima stabbing him with scissors in the neck, hitting him with the clothing iron in the head, and finally when that broke, she used a nearby lamp. The end result of these attacks was the death of Bill Nelson. Omaima then went to work dismembering Bill. His head was stored in a cooking pot and boiled. His hands were removed and put into a fryer to remove his fingerprints. The torso was skinned and hung to drain above the bathtub. Any other organs and additional meat were thrown into various trash bags or fed down the garbage disposal. As other parts were removed, they were mixed into trash bags along with turkey meat and cranberry sauce to disguise them. Eventually, Omaima got to the ribs and decided to cook them up restaurant style. She broke them down, put them onto a cooking sheet, and then slathered them in barbecue sauce before putting them in the oven. While Bill's ribs were cooking, she went into her closet and put on a red hat, red shoes, and a red dress. She then looked into the mirror and applied red lipstick. Once in her outfit, she pulled the ribs out of the oven and sat down at the table. According to her appointed psychiatrist, she took the first bite of the ribs and said, It's so sweet, so delicious. 
Jesus, I like mine tender. The psychiatrist went on to say that in 20 years of practice, he had never experienced a conversation with a subject so bizarre and psychotic. He diagnosed her as psychotic and suffering from PTSD. In December of 1992, just a little over a year after the initial incident, Omaima Nelson stood trial for murder and dismemberment. At the trial, her old boyfriend Robert Hansen testified and brought forth the scenario mentioned earlier about how he was tied up and threatened with a shotgun. This testimony allowed the prosecution to present a scenario that fit with evidence found in the bedroom. Omaima's defense was her abusive childhood and PTSD diagnosis. She also went on to allege abuse in her four-week marriage to Bill. She said she had no memory of dismembering Bill. Additionally, she said spirits of ancient Egyptians spoke to her and acted through her. She claims these spirits told her that if he was dismembered, he couldn't go on to the afterlife to haunt her in the future. In January of 1993, the jury deliberated for six days before acquitting her on first-degree murder charges, but found her guilty of second-degree murder charges and guilty in the assault of Hansen. She was given 28 years to life and is currently serving her sentence in the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. She came up for parole in 2006 and 2011 and was denied both times due to the parole board deeming her an unpredictable and serious threat to public safety. During her time in prison, she began a long-distance relationship with a 70-year-old disabled man. They married and were allowed conjugal visits before he passed away. His passing left Omaima with an unspecified large amount of money. She will be up for parole again in 2026. Hey guys, that's about all I have for you today in this case. It was a pretty bad one to say the least, but if you enjoyed it, you guys know what to do. I'm Jeremy the Crime Historian, checking out. Peace.